Please welcome Professor Juliet Vickery. Thank you very much, Keith, um, for the introduction and, of course, for the invite. And thanks to Becky for a fantastic start um, to today. Um, the phrase, uh, nature is in trouble, together we can save it, is a phrase I'd like to build on because that's what the BTO does. We work to bring all of you together to help us collect the data, to generate the evidence we need to drive that positive change. And it's really great to be here in Hampshire to talk about that because you are one of our most active counties, uh, as I will say a bit later, and it's a huge thanks to all of you because many of the examples of the science that I'm going to share will, without question, contain data from Hampshire that many of you will have collected. So I'm going to talk about the role of citizen science in understanding and conserving birds. And that's a title I've used deliberately to um, make it clear the extent to which we've hung on to our roots uh, of 90 years. So uh, this is the BTO's headquarters in Thetford. Um, our co-founder, Max Nicholson, visionary environmentalist, who almost 90 years to the day used this phrase about what he called cooperative bird watching, what we would now call citizen science. He recognised the power of that for bird conservation. And the heart of that, really, for us, um, as many of you will know, sits around many long-term, uh, large-scale monitoring schemes um, that citizen science uh, engage in. And I want to say two general points about that before I kind of start uh, for real. And that is, of course, that monitoring depends for its strength on being repeatable and constant. So we can compare between sites, between species, between years. But the first point I want to make is, despite that constancy, over its 90 years, these long-term schemes have changed and adapted continually to make the most of new methods, new analytical techniques, and to rise to challenges of new questions, new concerns environmentally and, and by society. So they're constant, but they've diversified. And the second thing is that you will, I'm sure, all know about our data because it spots the problem, big declines. But it's also very powerful in finding solutions. And that's what I want to highlight today. So it's not just about problem spotting, it's about problem solving. So, um, as I've said, many of you will be part and very familiar to many of our schemes, but I'm going to give a quick skim through the sorts of schemes from which I will be drawing data um, as an example of how we can use it uh, to drive change. And I'm going to start with what we refer to as the sort of gold standard, the Breeding Bird Survey. That's a joint venture between the BTO, RSPB, and JNCC. And almost 4,000 random one kilometre squares visited every year to generate the indices of about 120 breeding birds. And that is a government statistic, which is about the health of our wild birds and about the natural world. Um, it was run until very recently by Sarah Harris, now by James Haywood, and I know many of you uh, take part in this extremely important survey. The winter equivalent, again, many of you take part on, is the Wetland Bird Survey, or WEBS. Um, about 3,000 wetland sites visited, um, some throughout the year, but core counts in the winter, and that's part of the International Water Bird Bureau uh, Global Index. So again, data playing a part, in this case, on the global stage. Run for us by trees of frost. And closer to home, Garden Bird Watch, which is about allowing everyone um, to, to watch and observe birds on their doorstep, in a garden, in a park, in your backyard. Um, huge numbers of, of people that contribute to birds in their garden on a weekly basis. And some who've done this um, you know, since 1994. Again, a very important part of our survey, uh, our survey work uh, run by uh, Michelle Reeve, who some of you will know. So those are the kind of annual systematic surveys. The two others I want to just mention um, are what I've called unstructured real-time surveys. That's just about the fact that you should go out and record birds wherever you are, whatever you're doing, using BirdTrack, a handheld app. Um, and um, if you don't use this, I would really encourage you to look at the new app. It's fantastically easy and accessible. Uh, and that data, again, can be fed into uh, many of our long-term data sets to help them. So that's BirdTrack. And then once every roughly 20 years, we have this amazing stock take uh, of breeding and also wintering birds in the last atlas uh, across uh, Britain and Ireland uh, in the form of our atlas work. And um, the next atlas will be 2027, so we're always going to start building up to that um, in the next few years. 
So those sort of surveys tell us a huge amount about patterns and distributions, but we also have really great data on how well birds are breeding and surviving, and that tells us, um, helps us understand what's driving those patterns. Uh, and this is just a summary of that. So uh, some of you will be ringers. Uh, that tells us lots about breeding success and survival. Some of you will be nest recorders. Tells us lots about productivity. Uh, and as I will show you in my talk, these data are essential for us to help us understand what's driving the changes that we see uh, in our breeding and wintering birds. Uh, and that's run, and many of you will know Dave Leach, who's run our uh, demographic schemes, as we call them, for a very long time. So together, um, those represent a huge amount of information for the BTO. Um, last year, we estimated over 2 million hours of volunteer data feeding into our, um, our kind of databases. Um, and that's extraordinary. Uh, it's both fantastic, but it's also a real responsibility for us to use that data well. And I hope to show in this talk that uh, that is exactly what we're doing. And I just want to stress uh, again, really, uh, Hampshire, you are absolutely brilliant at this. Um, you have uh, an amazingly active um, group of people who are doing these surveys. This is the uh, breeding bird surveys for Hampshire. The blue are the allocated sites and the orange are the available sites. You rank in the top 10 of counties for us in terms of coverage. So 153 sites uh, allocated uh, have been allocated, 81% coverage. Um, that's amazing, and um, thank you. Still a few left, so um, those of you who would like to take one up, there's some orange squares there. Massive thanks to Glyn Edwards, so I, Evan, sorry, I know has led this for a long time, and has appointed two new regional organisers, so no pressure, but 83%, you're number seven, so maybe you can get to number five uh, in the near future. Thank you for that. This data will undoubtedly be in the data sets I'm going to be showing. And similarly, for, that's the progress over time of, of BBS, so you can see that steady increase, a blip around COVID, um, but a fantastic bouncing back in terms of coverage. And then I just want to also say the same about WEBS, the Wetland Bird Survey. Huge thanks to Keith and to the two Johns for keeping our co your coverage uh, so good here. 73% um, coverage, a national average of 60. So again, um, a, you know, real kind of blazing the way for us in terms of what it looks like to have a really well-covered and active county. So thank you um, for that. And rest assured, uh, those data will, will be in some of these data sets. So, um, so how do we use the, these data um, to uh, drive uh, positive change for birds? So it's used in lots and lots of ways, and I'm going to use this figure, which actually I used a lot at the RSPB around our work there, because the data that you collect feeds into every part of this circle, which allows us to uh, provide evidence to drive change. If you start with identification and monitoring, of course, that's what these surveys do. Um, they spot the problem. Having spotted the problem, uh, you have to prioritise which one is it you're going to take action on first. And often that's about the species declining at the greatest speed or the sites under greatest threat. Having prioritised, you need to understand then what's the problem before you can solve it. So there's diagnosis, that's also a lot of research. Um, and then move to testing solutions, often on the small, small scale. Hope Farm that Becky mentioned is a great example of that around farmland. And then you roll it out on the big scale, let's say through agri-environment schemes, and the monitoring we do evaluates the success of that. So science and the data that we collect plays a part in all of these stages. So what I'm going to do is just to show you for one group of species how you can take them from that start of spotting the problem right the way around to solving it and evaluating the action uh, using uh, BTO data. It takes a long time, um, and you'll see that from the work I'm going to present. And having done that, I'm going to then show you a few examples of other ways that we use our data, your data, um, to uh, solve problems that are facing uh, the birds that we all love. And the group we're going to start with is farmland birds. As Keith mentioned, very dear to my heart, it was a, uh, 10 years of my research was all around farmland birds at the BTO. And I'm going to show you how we can use citizen science data um, to uh, help understand the problem and to solve it. But I need to say from the outset, of course, it wasn't only BTO doing this. There were many other organisations working on it. I'm just going to highlight how we use long-term data that many of you will have collected. So farmland birds, diagnosing declines to testing solutions. Um, so this is work led here by these two um, men, Gavin, Surudina, and Dan Chamberlain. It's important that I recognise it's a big team of people that were involved in this. So how do you spot the problem for farmland birds? Well, that is all about trends. That's the breeding bird survey data that you collected tells us what's going on. 
How do you understand the problem? For us, that's looking at those trends and comparing them with either environmental change, what habitats are changing, or how are they doing in terms of survival or breeding success? So what's driving the problem? You then design solutions to address that problem, which you often test on a small scale, and then if they're successful, you can roll them out, and that's where we evaluate them with our large-scale data. So those are the four stages that I'm going to kind of whiz through uh, for farmland birds, and I'll start with a spotting of the problem. Uh, wasn't hard to spot if I show you the long-term data. This is uh, an index of change of 29 species of farmland birds from 1960s uh, to the 1990s. You can see that uh, catastrophic decline in the mid-1970s um, where these farmland birds, a whole suite of them, just headed downwards. So not too hard to spot that as a problem, um, but of course the size and magnitude of that problem was only made uh, obvious or relevant by the fact that you had collected so much of this data. What this fantastic paper did was then to look at agricultural change over the same time, and it took a whole load of things that were changing, chemical input, crop changes, loss of hedgerows, crunched them into one single index and just asked how fast are things changing over time. And that's what this slide shows. It's just an index of change on the vertical axis over time. And again, you can see pretty much nothing happening until the early 1970s, and then this very rapid uh, acceleration of agricultural intensification. And the farmland bird decline starts here, five years after roughly the onset of that change. And that's exactly what you would expect if those birds were dependent on farmland for resources, whether that's food or nest site. You'd expect a time lag between the onset of the change and the onset of their declines. And that's what was seen. So lots and lots of other studies also uh, provided evidence to show it was uh, without question driven by changes in farming. Um, the next question is, okay, what exactly is going on? Change, changes in farming, there were so many of them. What's the, what's the problem here? So the first question um, that uh, BTO scientists asked was, is it driven by a change in how well birds are breeding or a change in how well they're surviving? We could do that thanks to our fantastic ringing and nest record data. So um, this is kind of how very, very kind of, I suppose I'm simplifying some complicated science here. Um, but essentially, you look at a population trend of birds. This is numbers of birds on the vertical over time. And obviously, you've got an area where it's increasing, where it's stable, and where it's decreasing. So if survival is driving this change, you would expect to see really high survival where the birds are increasing, and you'd expect to see very low survival where they're decreasing. That's what you expect to see if that's what's driving the change. And to kind of cut a long story short, that's exactly what, they, what the scientists found. So basically, survival uh, is changing as the fate of these particular bird populations are changing. This is the yellow hammer. So it looks like survival's a problem. They're not surviving over winter as well as they had in the past. But is that enough to account for the sorts of changes that we're seeing, the magnitude of the changes we're seeing? Um, and again, uh, some very nice modelling work showed uh, that the answer to that is yes. And to try and again sow that uh, in a relatively simple form, this is now for reed bunting. This is the index of the population over time. That's what you see happening uh, in, in the world now. And what the scientists simply did was to take the data they had on breeding success and productivity to build a population model and to only allow survival to change. And if survival's driving the change that you see, then that line should match the observed line. And here's what you get from a model that you build. So the only thing changing here now is survival. Uh, and the, really the only point to make here, it pretty much matches. So changes in survival are driving the decline in reed buntings, and the scale of that change is big enough to account for the changes that we're seeing. So there's a whole uh, other lines of evidence to show that this is a problem. So you've kind of diagnosed what's going on in terms of the bird populations, what's driving that change. And again, to sort of cut a long story short around that, uh, it's a change in cropping. Sorry, I don't leave those. The nice bird slides get missed out for my science. But anyway, um, so here we are. This is, this is the switch from spring sown uh, to winter sown barley and wheat. So again, many of you will be very well aware of this change. In the past, you planted in spring, You'd harvest in autumn, you'd lead stubble over winter, and you'd plant again in spring. And that stubble was like a kind of giant bird table in the landscape, full of weed seeds, full of spilt grain. Uh, that's where the birds would find their winter food. 
What happens now, of course, is that you harvest in autumn and you plant pretty much straight away. Um, and so winter wheat means there's no stubble periods and that's kind of removed those giant bird tables from the environment we see. And it's a whole scale switch. So uh, this is what is driving uh, the declines of many of those uh, seed-eating birds like, uh, like yellowhammer, like reed bunting, um, into these declines. So there's the problem. We've diagnosed it using stacks of citizen science to do that. Uh, what's the solution? Well, you know, fairly obviously perhaps finding ways to put back uh, bird food into that farming landscape. And so there's been lots of trials looking at how you put back stubbles, how you put back winter bird crops, field margins provide seed food in winter, um, and these are the small-scale trials that have taken place that have shown uh, it provides the seed food and the birds do indeed use it. And they are now rolled out, as you all know, into agro-environment schemes and deployed by farmers uh, right across uh, particularly England. So the question is, are they working? Are they effective? And that's the next stage we're used to, again, using citizen science data. So this is where we've used the very powerful breeding bird survey um, to evaluate the success of agro-environment schemes. So this is a, just a schematic of a piece of uh, English farmland. Could be Hampshire, uh, I don't know if it is, but it's English farmland in which the green and the blue is land under agro-environment scheme management. Don't worry about the other colours apart from the black squares, which are breeding bird surveys, squares. And the great thing about BBS is because it's so widespread and there are so many squares, we can use it to look at the effectiveness of something like an agro-environment scheme because it overlaps with many areas that have this agro-environment scheme option within them. So the important point here is that most squares contain some land under um, agro-environment management, but different amounts. And that means we can ask the very simple question, really, uh, do we see healthier bird populations where we see more land managed under agro-environment scheme measures? Um, and uh, the fantastic answer to that is yes, we do. Um, and that is shown in this, this uh, slide. So what these scientists do with, did was to look for positive relationships between 12 different seed eaters and a whole range of options at different scales. That part doesn't matter so much, but what you're looking for here is really you want to see positive associations. So birds doing better where there's lots of option. Um, and uh, so this slide shows the number of species on the vertical axis and the direction of that relationship. And you can see that for the vast majority, for 11 of those 12, you see positive associations between how well those birds are doing in terms of populations and the presence of winter food options. The one is goldfinch, um, just so that you, because you'll all be asking that question. Um, but this is really good evidence that, that where you get it right, where there's enough of these options, and that's key, uh, it can have an effect. So um, great evidence that we provide winter food for winter food for seed-eating birds, you see a, an effect on their populations um, and uh, real support for keeping those agro-environment scheme measures in place, but also for both improving them in terms of the, the seed they provide, but what we need is more of them. You will all know that farmland birds are bumping along the bottom still, and that is almost certainly linked to the quality and the quantity of these options. So we need more uh, to get this right for farmland birds. So I hope I've shown you in that real kind of uh, whistle-stop tour of work that started in the 1980s, 1990s to now, how you can use um, both ringing data, nest record data, breeding bird survey data, all of these things to understand the problem, uh, to diagnose it, and to roll out solutions. Um, so very much using our data to be part uh, of those solutions. What I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about how we use uh, citizen science data in other ways to help us solve the problem. And I'm going to talk about um, a lot of work that's done by the uh, BTO science team led by James Pierce Higgins. So kind of a big kind of acknowledgement to him for his oversight of so much of this. Um, and I'm going to focus on uh, solutions to a whole range of, um, whole range of things. Um, so I've talked about direct evaluation. That's agro-environment schemes. That's that overlap between where we have breeding bird survey squares and in this case an agro-environment intervention. We can use it for that. I'm going to talk about the use of counterfactuals. So that is saying, what's the control? Can we use our data, 
breeding bird survey data to say what would happen if you did nothing. So it's like the background control. I'll explain that a bit more in a moment. How we can use it for, for guiding, in this case for nature-based solutions. This is about where we should be planting trees and where we shouldn't be planting trees. Um, and how we can use it in early warning for avian influenza, something that uh, Becky mentioned earlier. So let me start with the use of counterfactuals and explain what I mean by that. And I'm going to focus for this on lowland brooding waders um, and reserves. And both Becky and I know Julianne also in the audience will be very pleased to see the results of this because this is about how well RSPB reserves are doing for lowland brooding waders. This is work led for us by someone called Daria Massimino, who led the analysis, but working with uh, uh, co-authors co at RSPB. And the, the figure there is uh, a modelled... Uh, modelled populations, really, of lapwings. So it's showing you in red where they've basically disappeared, in blue where they remain in good numbers. And I just put that up there to remind ourselves of the fact that lapwing, once a wonderfully widespread uh, bird, is now uh, becoming increasingly restricted to reserves. And that really highlights how important getting management on reserves right for lapwing actually is. So the question that Dario asked was, can we compare population trends from the breeding bird survey, so that's a kind of what happens if you do nothing scenario, with what's going on on reserves? It sounds quite simple, but the matching of what's really the true control data is horribly complicated, so I'm going to skip over that bit and just tell you that what they actually did was to look for the same species, lapwing, redshank, um, on the same sorts of habitats outside of reserves and simply say, how does it compare? What's the evidence that reserves are doing better than the wider countryside? So I'm going to show you three figures now. Um, so on the vertical axis is simply an, a, an index of the trend of those populations uh, over time. So the green is on the reserve and the purple is off the reserve. And if the reserves are working, the green line should do better than the purple, basically. So let's just look at lapwing. So here you go. Green line is clearly doing better. I can see Julianne smiling in the front there. It's clearly doing better uh, than it is in the wider countryside. So that's a really nice, um, really nice bit of evidence to show that reserve management is working for this species. Um, and I can show you for both for red shank. Similarly, it's working for red shank. But you can see that for uh, yellow wagtail, um, there's, not, um, there's no evidence it's working. That's not surprising. The management isn't targeted to yellow wagtail, so it's kind of a nice control that species for which it's designed is having an effect. So really nice evidence that reserves are working for the two species for which were targets, uh, and that's shown entirely by using breeding bird survey data as the counterfactual, as the control. And there are many other interventions that we can be looking at using the data that many of you are collecting to know if these solutions are actually working. So that's a bit about... BBS as a counterfactual control. The second area, which is a really hot topic, and again speaks to Becky's mention about tackling biodiversity and the climate crisis together, is about tree expansion. The expansion of woodland uh, across England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. It's a big push um, to help us mitigate against climate change. Recognising trees both lock up and store carbon in the future and how important they are as a habitat also uh, for many breeding and wintering birds. So that's true if, for example, you expand Atlantic oak woodland uh, in the west of the country, great for things like red starts and pied flycatchers, but it's absolutely not true if you plant conifers on peat bogs. And that's the concern, that in many of these upland uh, uh, marginal areas, the expansion is for the wrong tree in the wrong place. What you want is the right tree in the right place. So how do you guide that kind of decision? So this is a work led um, by uh, John Calladine and Mark Wilson in Scotland, um, and they started looking at that because Scotland is obviously a real kind of pinch point about where this uh, could be the case. And so what we want to do is to say, can we provide some guidance about the areas that you really need to really avoid in terms of tree expansion, and similarly some areas where actually it might be quite a good place to be looking to do just that. So here's where the atlas comes in, because the atlas is essentially second to none in terms of coverage right across uh, uh, Britain and Ireland. But the problem with the atlas is it gives you information at 10 kilometer square level, which is far too big for decisions about tree expansion. So what John and Mark did was to take that data and build models to allow us to predict where waders will, will be and will not be based on environmental data, and then to kind of break that down to the one kilometer square level, which is the scale at which you would make a decision about whether to expand uh, woodland or to plant trees. 
Uh, and they use that to generate uh, maps right across the country, what we've called border sensitivity maps. So here you go, they've used these big scale atlas data, to kind of broken it down so it's relevant at a smaller scale. And then also, fantastically, because of BBS, they can say, let's see if the BBS squares in those, in those areas actually support what we predicted. How good do they look? And the answer is that that ground truthing from BBS tells you the models are actually really good. So now we can predict waders at much a much finer scale. And here's the maps they produced. So these are slightly different maps for upland and lowland, reflecting a slightly different wader assemblage. The very high areas are the hotspots for waders, or the, very, the red areas are the hotspots for waders. Uh, and what we're saying here is any application to change land use, particularly in this case trees, uh, in these areas needs to be looked at really, really carefully because it could have a big effect on already threatened species. But if you're looking in the blue and the grey areas, you may require uh, a little bit less scrutiny around that. So it's trying to guide at a high level where um, you should and should not uh, expand or plant trees. And those data are now being used. Uh, uh, they're available through the Working for Waders hub site. They're being used by Natural England and Forestry. And we're working now in Scotland to help uh, do better in Scotland in terms of the same sort of uh, where to plant and not plant trees. So that's a bit of how we use our data to guide, uh, to guide policy, to guide decisions around action, and to avoid um, you know, negative consequences, in this case, of biodiversity. And the final thing I want to talk about is how we can use it to tackle this very immediate threat of highly pathogenic avian influenza, which, Deb, which Becky uh, talked about earlier, and which, as we all know, wreaked absolute havoc to so many of our fantastic seabird colonies uh, last summer. These are just a few of the pictures on social media. If you're on social media, you'll have seen these. Really heartbreaking. Uh, and and so, so, so little that we can do about it, could do about it. Um, what we're working, to do very, very, working very hard to do is to be able to track this disease better and respond better in the future. And um, uh, in November last year, um, there was a very big meeting, three online meetings. I've already met someone in the audience from DEFRA who was at this meeting pulling together everything we know about what was the impact uh, and what is our kind of expert guess, expert kind of assessment about what we do next um, to be ready uh, for next summer. Um, and obviously, keeping our fingers crossed, it won't be the same. So these are some of the figures from that um, report, um, which some of you may have seen. So we all, you will perhaps know, great skewer, very, very heavily impacted by avian influenza. Gannet, similarly, very heavily impacted. Um, and because we hold a globally important population of great skewer, this is really important on the global stage uh, for us. Um, and then I've put here um, species like uh, sandwich and roseate terns, particularly guillemots, and some of the gull species, so kitty wake again, very heavily affected. So this report pulls together those figures, so we know about something about the scale of the loss. Um, there has some data here from birds that were tested positive by AFA, um, which is the, uh, the Animal Health Agency, um, so this is just looking at the sorts of numbers of birds um, that were tested positive. Um, and it's worth saying, uh, as Becky mentioned, that of course the most highly impacted wintering species were the wild geese, um, but we're keeping a very close eye now also on meat swan. Uh, and those who do webs um, may uh, be reporting, we've asked people to report dead birds, so we're very much keeping an eye on that um, right across the country. Um, so some of you that are doing the webs counts uh, may be already aware of that. So I said, you know, there isn't a great deal we can do, but we can absolutely be better prepared um, to respond quickly and, as Becky said, to help agencies join up in their action. But um, we have got the ability through the BTO to track mortality, which is very unusual. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that through these two graphs. So this is, again, just work in progress led by two of our younger scientists at the BTO, uh, Nina O'Hanlon and Daniel Johnson. And this is ring recoveries since 2011 to the present day. So many of you will know, may well have done it yourself, you find a dead bird, um, you might find a ring, uh, and you report that ring number. Obviously in this case taking great care around uh, all the guidance around handling dead birds. You can see for great skewer, uh, very, very few uh, ring recoveries of great skewer for most of the years from 2011. But when you get to 2021 and 2022, it rockets. Um, so this is real-time data because people are, you know, essentially reporting it when they find it. 
So looking at how we can use this better as an early warning sign of a problem, uh, something that we're actively working on now. And you can see the same is true for gamut. Um, so the ring data that we have allows us to uh, unusually to report uh, mortality. Of course, those rings tell us where they've come from too. So this is, a, this is just a schematic of uh, where birds that were, the rings of which were recovered had actually originated from. So the, the larger the red dot, the more recoveries were from those particular colonies. But some of these are very inaccessible colonies, may never be visited. It tells us about information about birds that are breeding uh, in areas that we simply can't access through standard survey techniques. So lots of work for us around uh, how to get a better early warning signal uh, around avian influenza within the UK. But we're also looking at that on a much wider scale. I'm going to end with this example because it pulls together so much information across an absolutely enormous scale. This is a migration mapping tool. It's available online. Uh, it's run by Stephen Bailey uh, and, again, our young scientist, Jacob Davis, who did lots of the modelling work for us. And it's asking, how can we use information on bird movement from ringing, bird numbers from things like bird track, and um, disease to, to try and predict if you have an outbreak in a poultry farm where it'll get carried to, if you like, by wild birds. So it took year-round variation on abundance. So that's from Eurobird portal. So this is schemes like the BTO schemes and the data you collect at a, at a European-wide scale being fed into the Eurobird portal. It takes movement data from Euring. That is a European uh, collation of ringing data. Uh, again, right across Europe, lots of data from the BTO. And it takes epidemiological models, so they worked with disease specialists to try and uh, predict the, out the outbreaks based on these movements. So you want to know how many birds there are, uh, how many are moving in which direction, and based on that you can work out the probability that a bird from A will take a disease to point B. So don't worry about these maps a minute. There are some fantastically complicated modelling. So this is for, this is for uh, about 12 different species every week of the winter, modelling the probability of where birds will move if you have an outbreak of avian influenza at a poultry farm, which is shown in blue, which you won't be able to see. So here is a bigger map of one of those weeks, week 46. So the blue are the poultry farm outbreaks. And the darker the shading, the more likely you are to have an outbreak of avian influenza, um, either in wild or other poultry farms. And it started, um, well, they started up here was the first outbreak. These are all subsequent outbreaks. And you can see that the blue actually matches the shading really well. It's a very effective tool, um, in, in kind of biological data terms anyway, a very effective tool to help predict the likelihood of an outbreak in one country impacting in another country. Um, and that is, a, a, say, a huge pulling together of information right across Europe, collected through citizen science schemes. And it's being used now and also being modified now. So I hope I've shown you how that the data that many of you collect can be used not just to spot problems but to solve them, either by directly evaluating an intervention, agri-environment schemes, uh, by using it as a counterfactual, the kind of what happens if we do nothing um, element, for guidance, uh, tree planting in this case, or, or establishment, and for early warning signals. And I just want to end, though, by saying uh, very briefly, it's not just about the birds, it's about the people. Um, and part of the problem solving is also getting more people on board collecting these data. And uh, I'd like to pick up on things both from Keith and from Becky around this. Um, we are truly um, grateful for all the work of our, of our existing surveyors and, and volunteers, but we have to be uh, bigger and better and more diverse. We have an amazing um, youth team that is blazing the trail for us in this sense, and I'm delighted that some of them are up there in the back gallery, probably seen them if I look hard enough, um, who have led a youth strategy for us. We have a young uh, trustee. Uh, they ran uh, last year the first ever Youth in Lecture Summit, and there's another one planned for this year. Amazing events uh, designed, developed, delivered by young people for young people. Um, and, you know, surprise, surprise, you want to engage a different group of people, you ask the people that are part of that group already how to do it, and you uh, find you can be fantastically successful. So this is, I'm really proud of this work of the BTO. Um, they energise and innovate all of us, um, and it's a very important part of our work going forwards. And again, thank you to the Cameron Bespolka Trust for their support of this. Um, 
We have a new project in Northern Ireland run by Sorrel Lyle, who actually was one of our youth advisory panel in the first year, which is all about trying to engage with communities who, for whatever reason, feel outside nature, who we don't serve well with our work and who we need to bring in and help engage with nature because of the huge benefits it brings both to them and because nature needs us all uh, to, to help and support it. So there's that work uh, going on in Northern Ireland. We haven't lost sight of the fact um, that we have, of course, still got, sorry to the men in the audience, a male-dominated um, membership and engagement, and we want more women to be engaged. And it's wonderful to hear about the WhatsApp group in Hampshire around that too. Um, just to share some information. So, so as, across all of our schemes, we have about a 50-50 male-female uh, gender ratio. Um, but you can see there's big differences in our schemes. So here you've got the wetland bird survey and the breeding bird survey um, are more uh, actively engaged in by the, the men in our membership um, and garden bird watch and nest and neighbours more so by women. Uh, we don't know why that is. Um, we're pleased we offer schemes that appeal to everyone. Uh, the things that have been mentioned have been mentioned earlier uh, by the women's WhatsApp group about safety, about confidence, uh, about maybe having the primary responsibility for caring. We're not sure whether that's why people, uh, many women will do those schemes that involve being closer to home and a bit more flexible. But uh, if it's about confidence and ID, we think we can do something about that. And in lockdown, we moved a lot of our training ID schemes online for obvious reasons. And what we find is a huge engagement, particularly from women, in the online ID scheme. So here's a, just a bit of a schematic. Over 3,000 people have signed up for these schemes, uh, for these ID courses. <laughs> Um, and you can see a very large number of those are women. Um, so I came from a science background. I know lots about dippers and brent geese. I'm not a hardcore birder. I find some of these sort of hardcore birding events quite intimidating too. Maybe that's why women prefer these online events. But it certainly helps us. And what we really want to do is try to nurture many of these new people uh, to come forwards and do more of our schemes. And if you haven't done any of these courses and you're a BTO member, they're fantastic. If you're not a BTO member, they sell out to BTO members before they get to the big wide world. So another good reason to join the BTO. So it's about people as well as science. Um, and we're doing all we can to try and bring more people uh, into our, our work and into the natural world. And it's great that Hampshire's doing very similar amazing things around youth and also around uh, women in birding. Uh, People's Plan for Nature, which Becky mentioned, has a call to NGOs and charities. Some of it is around using evidence well. We are absolutely ready to use evidence the best way we can to support this really exciting People's Plan for Nature. Um, and we'll be looking at how we do that uh, over the next year too, to make sure that we are joined up uh, with this you know, fantastic group of 100 people who've called on us all uh, to do more. So knowledge is power. It enables everyone to make informed decisions concerning nature. That's bang on for us. And that's what we will carry on doing thanks to the data that so many of you collect. And just on that note, I'd like to say thank you to all of the BTO staff and supporters and any of you that make this work possible. And uh, um, those who aren't part of it, do come and talk to me about how you might like to get involved. Thank you very much.